I'm Azar Majidi, the President of Organization for Women's Liberation, a member of Folke Commons Party Ekmetis Leadership, and a member of Executive Committee of Euromed Feminist Initiative. I'd like to share my ideas, opinions, and uh, my take of the horrific event of last week in Paris, the terrorist action against Charlie Hebdo, and the consequent arguments and discussions and debate that has um, this event has given rise to. This event has created some very important debates that they need to be clarified, they need to be addressed. As far as a terrorist action is concerned, well, every human being with uh, any decency would condemn that. That's, there's no doubt about this. But questions, issues that have been questioned in the past week are freedom of expression, the right to offend. If you offend a prophet or a leader of a faith or a group, does that mean you are being racist against those groups and uh, why these Islamist organizations are able to recruit these young people, these underprivileged young people to their ranks and uh, not only they commit such horrendous crime but they themselves become victim to their actions and to these groups. These are, to my opinion, our main issues that we have to discuss. We have to look just a tiny bit, go back and look in the, into the history of these events. Terrorism is not a new thing, but in this shape and form, it goes back, especially, particularly, to September 11, 2001 when the two towers were expl uh, exploded in New York and many people lost their lives. And uh, they said Al-Qaeda has done it and Al-Qaeda, uh, Islamist, an Islamist organization, took responsibility. After that, we have seen an escalation of these actions, escalation of wars, escalations of killing, murders, ruining societies altogether. From that, if you look at it, you just don't have one set of terrorists who we call them Islamist terrorists. There are two sets of terrorists, or as we say, two poles of terrorism. It's not only these Islamist organizations and poor youth who become recruited by these organizations. It's also what we call state terrorism, which is the West, the NATO, led by the US, and very active participation of Israel. These two terrorist poles, they've been fighting each other, they've been creating murders, bloodshed, ruins in their path. Look at Iraq, look at Afghanistan, look at Libya, look at Syria, look at Palestine, Lebanon, and here this last event, but then we had some other uh, terrorist actions in Paris, we had in uh, Barcelona, we had in London, and small ones here and there. So, a very important feature of our today's society in 21st century is terrorism and bloodshed and ruin of many, many lives and many societies. But let's look at the Charlie Hebdo incident. 
the first time, if I'm correct, it, it was in 2006 when Charlie Hebdo came under the threat of the Islamists because of republishing cartoons of Muhammad, which were first published in a Danish newspaper. And many people thought they were crazy, they're provoking, they're offensive, whatever. But Charlie Hebdo, in the stand of defending freedom of expression, published them and did not apologize for what it did. I remember then I gave a statement on behalf of Organization for Women's Liberation saying that don't apologize. Islamists are blackmailing you. Anywhere they have the power, they keep, they may, they lash, they stone, and as soon as they're not in power, they act victimized. They're offended. They don't give a damn when they're in power, they kill, and once they're not in power, they come and um, resort to democracy or to tolerance, or to being offensive, or being provoked, and many people buy that. I'm not talking about Muslims. I like to make a clear distinction between Muslims, ordinary Muslim people, and Islamist organizations. There are two different categories. Islamist organizations are not spokesperson of Muslim people. That's another, that's one of the fallacies that have uh, rise in these situations. They keep talking about more than one billion Muslims have become offended by these uh, cartoons. Oh, give me a break. First of all, how these statistics has taken, anybody who's born in a country who, where the main religion is Islam, if their family is not considered from another religion, is automatically considered Muslim. A two-year-old, a one-day-year-old, they're Muslim, and they're part of that one billion. A child who has no religion, to my opinion, they just put parents' religion on them. And another one, among this population, there are a lot of non-practicing Muslims, if to ask them, they will say they're Muslim, but they're not practicing, they're not, they don't pray, they don't do any of these things. It's just a culture or tradition of their society more than a religion. There are quite a few who, like me, are atheists, but they would put me on that one over one billion population. And worse, then an organization like Al Raide, like Daesh or ISIS, Al Nusrat, Jihad, Hamas, or whatever, Hezbollah, or Islamic regime, they become my spokesperson. Isn't that crazy? And then they talk about over one billion people being offended. Another wrong argument or fallacy besides this kind of statistics, is the fact that Charlie Hebdo is only used to be published in 60,000 issues. 60,000 issues of a magazine in France offends over than 1 billion people in the, in the, on the earth? Come on now. These are all blackmails by Islamist organizations, which by no means represent Muslim people, not every person living in a country who by that, wrongly by that statistic is called Muslim, but Muslim people who are practicing Muslims. So we have to distinguish who, between these different categories. Islamist organization might get offended, but who cares? And they blackmail the society and they use intimidation and murder for shutting the society up, getting what they want. And we should stop that. We should say no, no, no. Principle of free speech is one of the most important principles of a free and equal society. And I like to qualify that. 
with unconditional freedom of speech. As soon as you put some conditions, it would not it would work for the ruling classes and against the deprived population. It's you and me who's going to suffer. The state gets more power, you're controlling us, and we lose. So unconditional freedom of expression is a principle we should strongly defend, strongly stand for, and strongly safeguard. Nothing is sacred, nothing. Faith, ideology, prophet, a leader, nothing, nothing is sacred. Everything can be ridiculed. Everybody, anybody must have the right to ridicule any faith, any ideology, any religion, any leader, any person that he wishes, wishes to do. This one point that we should clear, Start, have it clear and put aside. No, when let's say that yes, Muslim people are offended, but being offended is it the equal to being discriminated against? To offend, is it equal to racism? This is another fallacy that we have met in the debates and discussions of the past week. They have created a very fancy name too, Islamophobia. I don't know who created it, but I'm sure that Islamic states have spent a lot of money to make sure that this is spread, this is taught, this is bec has become prevalent. Islamic regime, Saudi Arabia, Islamic regime of Iran, Saudi Arabia, and etc. Islamophobia is not, to my opinion, is a wrong concept. And Islamophobia, even if it's not wrong and we accept that there is Islamophobia, is not equal to racism or discrimination against Muslims. Just like Christianophobia, Judaismophobia, Hinduphobia, Buddhistphobia, Jehovah's Witnessphobia is not racism against the people who adhere to that religion or faith. We have to be clear on that. This is a fallacy. It sounds very chic, it sounds very complicated and complex and sophisticated, but in real terms is hypocrisy, is wrong. We should not accept it. To be honest with you, Islam, the way I have experienced it, I am scared of it. I've seen how they murdered Islamist regime I'm talking about. I'm talking about Islamist organizations and Islamic states, again, I have to make that clear, how they have murdered and killed my comrades, how they came to my, almost got me and tortured me and killed me and had to escape. I've seen what they do. I've seen what they're capable of doing. So of course I'm scared of it. But that doesn't mean I'm racist against Muslim people. Many Muslim people have a faith and sometimes don't even know the depth of the teachings of Islam. Or even if they do, they say it was for the old time, not now. We have to, as I said one more time, to just be clear that people don't call me racist, we have to distinguish between that. So Islamophobia to me doesn't, it should not be used. Islamophobia is not equal to discrimination against Muslim population and you should be able to ridicule any faith, any religion, any prophet, any leader that you like. Another question that would, has, be, has, given, has, been, has, has risen in this, is in this debate is Well, shouldn't we, we should not provoke. Provocation and offense are almost the same. If we, if we put, see, I might not like 
these cartoons. But to be honest with you, the first cartoons that the Danish paper published, I thought they were very distasteful. Not because they have uh, ridiculed Muhammad, it's just they didn't look very nice. But that doesn't mean anything. My taste does, should not determine the freedom of someone else to express himself. We should learn to be tolerant. If someone offends, offends me, I could either give it back to them and I try to offend them in one way or just go my way and tell them to shut up. But they should have the right to do what they want to do. But another question that comes, why then so many young people become, have have become victims to these organizations, have been, been recruited by these organizations. This is something that we should look at, not to excuse their action, not to excuse terrorism, not to come to the conclusion of condition, put conditions on freedom of expression, narrow down freedom of expression, but to understand the roots, the root cause of the problem. Why? It, to me, it seems obvious. You're talking about a population which is desperate, which is angry, which is fed up, which got up to here with discrimination, with murder, with bloodshed, with ruin with no hope for the future. I'm not going back to the Algerian war and independence war or the Maghreb or all of the colonialist parts or Vietnam war. I'm going to just stick to this past 20 years, two decades. Look at Afghanistan. Look at Iraq. The country is just a total ruin. Every day, 10, 15, 20 people die because of a bomb or a terrorist action. People have been killed, more than a million people have been killed. They've become displaced. Sectarianism is killing more people every day. Sectarianism that has been created by the war of US, Britain and their allies in Iraq. And now ISIS, who's gone there, with the help and green light of the Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Turkey, and the Western governments. Look at Syria, look at Libya, look at Lebanon, and look at Palestine. How many more people, Palestinians, have to be killed by Israeli government till we say enough is enough? We're talking about that part of the world that every day sees some kind of bloodshed and ruin, no future, poverty, and sees the, the dictatorships, the, the spots that are governing their uh, countries are totally supported by the Western governments. And then when we come to Western governments, the population who have originally go back there, like they're, they're my second or third generation of, a, of, of African origin or Middle Eastern origin, here they're discriminated against systematically. They are deprived, poverty and lack of rights and being systematically abused or harassed by the police is part of their everyday life. So what happens, a desperate group of people see no other way out, they cannot find a way to fight this situation in a more productive and constructive way. Desperate situation calls for desperate measures. They are recruited by these murderous organizations and they not only commit a horrendous crime, they themselves become victims to these monstrous organizations. 
So, now, what can we do? Definitely we have to defend unconditional freedom of speech. Just look at it, just in parentheses. David Cameron has gone to Paris for a show of the defense of uh, freedom of speech, comes back and wants more control on people's contacts, messagings or emails or whatever. It's first result, more limit, limits on freedom of, pri of on pro people's privacy, freedom of actions, freedom of expressions. We should stand by on condition of freedom of speech. We should stand for our civil liberties. We should not allow governments with this kind of excuses limit our rights, our civil rights, civil liberties, and our freedom. We should definitely condemn any act of terrorism committed by Islamic groups or by the states, like Western states. And we should try to fight racism in a systematic way. But, well, that sounds like a very good lecture. How can we do that? Well, to my opinion, the only way we can do it is we have two sets, poles, fronts, whatever you want to call it, of terrorism, Islamist one and the state one that I explained in the beginning. They fight against each other and in their fights we are the ones who are losing, we are the ones who are being murdered, we are the ones whose life is ruined. And they help each other. They constantly help each other. And there is a vicious cycle of more murder, more, more deprivation, more ruin, less rights. So the only way we can do it is we create our own front or pole. We become a pole against both of them. Don't side with one of them, against both of them. We try to gather, mobilize, organize all the decent people, freedom-loving, egalitarian, civilized people, bring them together and say, let's fight together against both. And maybe Hopefully, we can reach a better world, a world that respects and guarantees freedom, equality, prosperity, and tries to uproot terrorism and respects everyone's rights, everyone's equality. I know it sounds like a dream, but it's possible. Thank you so much.